this is the season of the year when the entire Christian mystery is concentrated. And for the next week, beginning on Sunday, our churches will be crowded to overflowing. And I wonder to what degree they will understand the great mystery. Beginning on Sunday, Palm Sunday, and culminating the following Sunday in Easter or Resurrection. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, he said, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Oh, they'll tell that story for Good Friday. When you heard the word Christ, did you think of another? Another died for you, and therefore vicariously he suffered. For well, that's what it would be, having the function of a substitute would be the vicarious state. And if he died for our sins, for well, then his suffering and his shameful death were vicarious. For well, that's what the word would mean. One who takes the place of. One who represents or takes the place of something that is primary or original. There is another meaning to the word vicarious. And that is an occurrence in an unexpected or abnormal part of the body instead of the usual one. For instance, the bleeding of the gum, which replaces the discharge of the uterus in vicarious menstruation. That's what you'll we'll find in Webster's Third International Dictionary. The bleeding of the gum, which sometimes displaces or replaces that which would be the normal discharge of the uterus in a vicarious menstruation. In this sense, birth from above the skull replaces the normal birth from below of the womb. That's the normal natural portion of the body where one should be born. Here is one now being born from the abnormal portion of the body, which is the skull. Now, if he died, as we are told, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, which you will read in Paul's 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. I think it's the third verse. Now let me turn now to the scripture, for it used to be taught in ancient Israel that the father's sins were actually visited to the children, to the third and fourth generation. Now comes the new revelation that voice said, which you will find in the 31st chapter of the book of Jeremiah the 29th to the 30th and 31st verse. In those days, meaning the day of the Lord, when man begins to awake, in those days it shall no longer, he said, that the fathers ate sour grapes and their children's teeth were placed on edge. 
every one shall die for his own sin. Each man who eats sour grapes, his teeth shall be placed on edge. No longer the substitute. Therefore, who is this Christ? I say, if the word Christ in any way conveys to you the sense of an existent something or someone outside of you is delusive. You have a false Christ. For here, every man, but everyone, shall die for his own sin. Now this is the mystery, as we are told, hidden for ages and generations, but now made manifest to his saints, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, who are his saints? The saints are simply the redeemed. It has nothing to do with anything that our so-called holy men say in this world. <coughs> there is no holy group on earth that could take an individual, male or female, and declare that that one is a saint. That's the height of nonsense. The saint is the elect, the called, the chosen, the redeemed, called by God. And only the one called knows that he is called. He can tell it to another. But it is a law of human behavior that the man called, call him a conscious man, for all, all the others are not really conscious, even though they seem to be conscious. A conscious man shall not appear as the one he profoundly is. If he does, he will definitely become a caricature of himself. For Christ is not of this world. This is what Paul meant when he said in his third chapter of Galatians, that you should not know Christ after the flesh. And in his second letter to the Corinthians, when he said, from now on, I regard no one from the human point of view, even though I once regarded Christ from the human point of view, I regard him thus no longer. So no longer does that man who has been called, who has been awakened, can ever regard Christ from the human point of view from the world of flesh. And yet it is in this world of flesh, and only here in the world of flesh, that he is awakened. No one can consummate the bliss without being generated on earth. It is right here on earth. But earth, does not end when a man seems to die. All right, he comes to the end, and my senses cannot follow him, and he seems to go. And I see him cremated, and the dust is scattered. But he has not died to himself. So that the world does not terminate at that point where my senses cease to register. It. He is still in a world terrestrial, just like this. And he continues his journey until that moment in time when he is called, when he is awakened, when he is elected. That being does not, whether he be here, there, or elsewhere, ever appear as the one that he knows that he is, if he ever dares to play that part and try to be something important in the eyes of those that he's talking about, he becomes a caricature of himself. 
But from that moment on, he is one with the glorified body of the risen Lord. And that living glorified body is made up of the redeemed, of the elect, of those who are chosen, those who are called. Ultimately, everyone will be called. So it is happening. But it is happening. That's the strangest thing. Here, the drama that will be unfolding for us next week, and all the pulpits will be talking about it. And they will tell us that he is risen. And I will not deny that. He is not only risen, he is rising. This is something to be done absolutely and continuously. It's something that is set up that it is not related in some way to, say, the happenings now. It is an eternal drama without reference to position in time, without reference Sometimes the bleeding of the gums, sometimes, is simply a replacement of the discharge that would normally come from the uterus. And therefore it is called a vicarious menstruation. You can read that in the Webster's Third International. Look it up and see the definition given to it. I tell you from my own experience, it's the most exciting, the most thrilling, the most unexpected thing in the world. Who would ever think for one moment there was another portion of the body from which man could be born. And that that man is a supernatural man. He is not the man that was born from the womb. That which was born from the womb is flesh and blood. And flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. That which is born from the skull is spirit. That's God himself. It's from the unexpected, the unnatural portion of the body instead of that which is the normal, natural portion of it. And that is the Christ in man. That will be talking about for the next week from every pulpit in, the, in Christendom. But I am telling you who you really are. You are Christ. If you have not yet become aware of it through this wonderful series of experiences, you will become aware of it. But until you become aware of it through actual personal experience, you will continue the journey even though you go through the gate called death. But death does not end your journey. You cannot end it in eternity. 
for the being in you is immortal. It cannot die. That being is your own wonderful human imagination. That is the divine body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your own wonderful human imagination. It's the immortal you and cannot die. But it has to be born. I'm born here in this world of flesh and blood. You cannot consummate the bliss which is heaven until you actually in this world below, which is the world of flesh and blood, have this series of experiences called Christendom in Scripture. A series of experiences in this manner. Christianity is based upon the affirmation that a series of events happen in which God expressed himself in action for the salvation of man. Well, that series of events I have gone through. I am telling what I know from experience. It begins with your own awakening. You awake in that unexpected, abnormal portion of the body. And as you awake within the skulls, you don't expect to be awakened there, if you're going to be born, we think of birth from the womb. I came out of my mother's womb. Even if it was caesarean, it is still from the womb, though it is simply a section from the side of her body, they're still taking me from that womb. You're not taken from the womb when you're born from above. You're coming actually literally from above and is out of your own skull. But first you are awakened. And when you are awakened, then you come out and it's an actual birth from above. Now you may tell it to those who are drawn to you because no man comes unto you save the Father calls him. You're in search of the Father. And soon after the birth, you're going to find the Father. And you're going to find him as yourself. Then you tell it to those whom the Father draws. But you are the Father. You are drawing your own now. They're all coming to you that can come. Many fall by the wayside. They can't take it. So they go back. They can't conceive for one moment that Christ means what you're talking about. You haven't had the experience. You know what you're talking about. They have a fixed idea concerning what Christ is. They use the word, they have something on the outside. You use the word, and you mean only one thing. <coughs> Your own wonderful human imagination. There is no other Christ. There is no other God. There is no other Father. That is the divine body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your own wonderful human imagination. But it has to be born again. Born from above. And it comes in the unexpected, abnormal part of the body, right out of the skull. And when it comes out and you tell the world, you cannot then ever appear as the one you so profoundly know that you are. If you do, and you try to put on all the nonsense about it, you're simply going to be a caricature of yourself. Many years ago, maybe 12 years ago, I went to my friend's office on sunset. And this very good looking man, a handsome man, about six feet, all dressed in his light, long white robe with a little girdle around his belt, around his belly, no shoes, it was a hot summer's day, with a black beard, beautifully trimmed, here to his shoulder. Someone once told him he looked like Christ. And so he's going to play his part. So he came in asking for money. And my friend and his wife, they work together. She is the secretary and he is the agent. And they said, no, we give to charity, but we give through organized things like the Red Cross and so on. We do not give this way. He was insulting in the most, well, unmerciful manner. He was now playing the part of Christ. He asked me, he said, brother, would you give me something? I said, yes. So I gave him a dollar. He thanked me. He pronounced a blessing upon me. A curse upon them. He is Christ. So my friend said to me after he left, why did you give him a dollar? I said, 
I go to a picture and I spend three dollars, three fifty for a show. This is funnier. This is far more amusing. Here is this thing. What's a dollar? Let him go and have himself a sandwich for his dollar or whatever he wants. Well, here is someone someday misled him. There is no physical description of Jesus in the Bible. None whatsoever. But someone, based upon the pictures that artists have painted over the years, told him he looks like Christ. And so he began to be more and more in the outward appearance of Christ. But you see, I was born with that sense of humor. He amused me, so I gave him a buck for him. When I was a little boy in Barbados, and we had these pictures twice a week, but on the film it would run for a little while, and all of a sudden it came to the end, you heard the tape over and over and over, up would go the lights, then you would have to uh, rewind it, put on another tape, and then you run another one. So they ran five or six reels of these things, whatever they were. Twice a week, I paid a butcher of my father his six cents to go into the pit. The pit was what we called the orchestra. And we sat above in what would be, say, the balcony. That was 36 cents, and the pit was six cents. And I would pay him six cents to laugh at the wrong time. When everybody was about to cry, he had to laugh. If he didn't laugh, he wouldn't get my six cents. But he never failed. But every time he did it, down would come the manager with his little light, take him out, and he never saw a whole picture. Not in his life. But twice a week, we had fun. All of a sudden, the girl is tied to the tracks, and the train is coming through, and they're all screaming, and all of a sudden, his name was Mashma. He had feet like that. No shoe could fit it, so we called him Mashma, meaning he could mash things. And Mashma would sit there, and they knew exactly where he was. Sometimes he would get lost in the thing himself, so he couldn't laugh too early. But sometimes he was carried away and he laughed early, when it was a tear, tear jerker. And that night he missed it completely. But I was given that way, to just make fun of this entire thing that seemed so serious to the whole vast world. And week after week, well, I had my fun, he had his, and the others enjoyed my sixth sense because they too were shocked as he was pulled out and taken out. It's good to be shocked when someone is so pompous and he is so holy and he thinks that he is this. Turn away. Any man who thinks he is holy and puts on that act for you, just turn away. For no man who has had the experience is going to put on any appearance concerning what he knows he is. Because you can't describe it in flesh and blood. You could not in any way dress up to look like the being that you know that you are. For no mortal eye could see it. It takes the incurrent eye. It takes the eye of Peter. Whether it be a little girl of eight months or eight years. Or a lady of thirty. It takes the incurrent eye to see the being that you really are. And you don't care who sees it. You know what one has to see it. One has to bear witness to what you know from your own experience. But you aren't going to go out and talk about it because no mortal eye can see it. So I say it is a law of human, I would say, understanding that the man who actually has experienced it, and I call him a conscious man. All the others are sleeping. But the conscious man shall not appear as the one that he actually knows in the depth of his being that he is. Because if he does make any attempt to appear that way, he's only fooling himself and he simply makes a caricature of himself. And this is what Paul meant when he said not to know Christ after the flesh. For he's not of the flesh. He's a completely different being. He's supernatural. So Sunday they're going to see him on a donkey in their mind's eye riding physically. And they're going to see him on Friday on a wooden cross. They'll see him taken down and put into a little grave and they're still digging for it in the Near East. 
And then they believe that someplace in the Near East he came out of a little tomb, made with mortal hands, a little tomb. And they say, although they read it in scripture, it's called Golgotha, where they buried him. They were still think, well, the area resembled a skull, and that's why they called it Golgotha. It doesn't resemble the skull, it is the skull. That's where he's buried. And this is where he's crucified, on man. He's crucified on humanity. And he is buried in man. He rose in a man, and then men, and continues to rise in individual men and women. Eventually he will rise in all, and there's only one Christ. So in the end, one body, one spirit, one Lord, one God, and Father of all. And not one is going to be greater than the other. When you know it, you don't want to be, because it's one. To be greater than your spirit, there are going to be others. It's one body, one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all. That's the Christ that I'm talking about. That's the one that if you understood how to read it, Blake, not Blake, but Paul is not confusing when he tells you Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He is quoting, not quoting, but he's implying the 53rd chapter of Isaiah where upon him all the iniquities of men were placed. And just like a little lamb before the butcher, and the sheep before the shearer is dumb, he opened not his mouth. But he saw the fruits of his travail, and he was satisfied. Yes, he waits upon man here, just as quickly, as innocently, as willingly, when the will in us is evil, as when it is good. Because he knows that we are asleep. And we can dream. You don't blame a man for a dream. If tomorrow morning your wife woke and told you, you know, last night I had the most fantastic experiences with a man, and it wasn't you. And she's talking to her husband at breakfast. You think he's going to strike her for a dream? If she came home and said, these are the realities. I had them on the outside. He might lose his temper. But is, is he going to actually ostracize her for a dream? He's not going to ostracize her for a dream. And yet that dream is telling something. Now this is a dream, because we are not yet awake. When he calls us and we are awake, something happens in the one in whom he awakes, and the whole vast world changes. A complete change takes place within him. He doesn't see anything as he saw it formerly, but nothing. Everything is different in his world. He sees everyone as Christ asleep. Until that one awakes, he still sees Christ. He sees Christ in his wife, in his child, in his friend, in his neighbor, in everyone. And there's no other way, after he awakes, that he could ever see anyone. He can't see anyone but Christ. Because Christ is the reality of man. That essential being is your own wonderful human imagination. And he's not going to condemn anyone who is dreaming. Well, who is dreaming? Christ is dreaming. He took upon himself the limitations of this body. And he dreams it. Well, I'm going to tell you, you can dream a noble dream tonight. And he doesn't limit you to what you can dream. You can dream anything. He is the creator and will actually externalize the dream. You want to dream that you're successful? What's wrong with that? If you know what you mean by success, what would it be like if it were true? Do you dare to assume that it is true? If you dare to assume that it is true, well then live as though it were true. And it will become a fact. You will actually 
find yourself externalizing your assumption that when you began to assume it, it had no basis in fact. That's how it works. Then you know who you are. It doesn't mean because you project it onto the screen of space that tomorrow night you're going to have the experiences of which I speak because no one can tell you when you're going to have them. It could happen tonight. I only hope that everyone here will have it in the immediate present. I do hope. But I have no assurance that you'll have it now. But I do know you're going to have it. That no one will fail in eternity to have it because God would fail and God cannot fail. And God is in you. And God is your own wonderful human imagination. That is God. The eternal body of man is the human imagination. And that body is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other Jesus Christ. None. And he is the one who is suffering. So Blake could say it so beautifully. Thou sufferest also with me, although I behold thee not. You can't tell me that you actually see your imagination. You feel it. You exercise it. And it's you exercising yourself. But you don't see it as you see objects in space. You see the results of the exercise of imagination. You see the fruits. But you don't actually see that invisible God. Because God can be seen only by his Son. No one knows him but the Son. And he knows who the sun is. Outside of that, you aren't going to see imagination, but you see imagination in operation. Because imagination is God. And God is invisible to all, save his son. His son sees him. And he sees the sun. So I tell you, your own wonderful human imagination is the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't look for him in any other place than where he is now. He's seated right here. Just where you are, that's where he is. He is buried in you, but not so deep that in his dream he can't hear my words. I'm stirred, because truth is talking to truth. Deep is speaking to the deep. And he hears my words, because I'm talking to myself in you. And that self in you, is the being that is speaking. It is one. It is Christ. And one day, suddenly, it's going to happen. And just as you're told in that definition that I read you earlier tonight, yes, it will come in an unexpected, abnormal part of the body. Instead of the usual one. And that abnormal, unexpected part of the body where he's born is your own skull. That's where he comes out. And when he comes out, it's not another, it's yourself. Who woke? I did. Who was present? No one. I was alone. And who pushed away the stone? It is said the stone was rolled away. I did. Well then how did you come out? A midwife? No midwife. Came out by myself. I pushed myself out and pull myself out of that tomb to find that the tomb was really a womb because the minute I came out the symbolism of the birth surrounded me the child wrapped in swaddling clothes and the spirit is the wind and it was the wind that disturbed me and disturbed the witnesses that came to witness the event and they heard the wind too. So everything happened just as described in the book of Luke and the book of Matthew. I think Luke describes it more beautifully, more vividly. John does it perfectly, but at the end in symbolism, and unless you know the language of symbolism, you don't see it. Because he speaks of the empty tomb, but the little cloth, the little napkin, was a side from the body. Here was the cloth, the linen clothes were there, but the little napkin was not part of it. It was part of it in the beginning. It covered his head. That's where he came out. And then the napkin was removed, and all by itself. Well, the napkin in the ancient world meant simply the afterbirth. 
the placenta. That was the meaning of the word. It is telling you a birth took place because that wrapped the head. If it wrapped the head, then it came out of the head. That's where it was. And the napkin is all by itself, all rolled up. So if you understand the language of symbolism, you'll know what took place in that empty tomb. And the tomb was where he was born. He came out of that tomb and left behind him the placenta, the afterbirth, implying that a birth took place there. But where is it? I see the evidence, the body. I see the linen clothes. But now what actually came out of those linen clothes? You can't see it because it's spirit. Only the heavenly eyes can see it. Only those who are already awake within the body of the living God. Those who are now the living stones in that temple. And they rejoice that one more has joined the living body. But others can see it. But those who know the symbolism, they know something to place. But John tells it beautifully, but he tells it symbolically. While Matthew and Luke, they tell it, or they tell it that mortal mind can understand. And they tell it as though it happened to the womb of a woman. And it never happened to the womb of any woman. It happened to the skull of woman, yes. But I'm speaking of generic man, male, female, made he then. So it comes out of both the skull of male or female. Because what is coming out is above the organization of sex. So man in the resurrection is above the organization of sex. You're told that in him there is neither male nor female. No, not even Greek or Jew. Bond or free. Just one. So something comes out. You don't depend upon any split being to create. You create all out of yourself, for the body is one. And you are that one. But you make no claim to anyone in this world. You still are the devoted father, devoted husband, devoted friend, a friendly neighbor, and you play the same part in the eyes of those who know you. And you walk the earth until the very end, and no one would ever know, save those that you took into your confidence and you tell them what happened to you. Some believed you, and some disbelieved. But it doesn't really matter. Their response to what happened to you is their judgment of themselves. If they do not believe that is a story, well, let them go on, until one day they will actually understand it from experience. See, I have no feeling for Christianity save that which the individual has experienced. Organized Christianity means nothing to me. Last year they threw out a hundred saints. Well, you can't throw anything out of the body of God. If they were saints in the beginning, they will still have to be saints today. So an organization gets together and say, I'm going to make saints. And then they bring this woman in, or that man in, and these people in, and pronounce them as Saint so-and-so. Saint Christopher has been dethroned. Saint Barbara, dethroned. And all the other saints, a hundred of them last year. No man can make a saint. The lowliest of men, suddenly he calls you, unexpectedly. And when you are called and incorporated into the body of love, which is God, and then saint, your saint, like the word being sent, to fulfill scripture. And when you fulfill it, you are a living stone in the one body that is God, and you are one with that glorious body that is God. Not a little portion of it, it's only one body. And you are that body. So anyone seeing you after that in the eyes of the spirit world, they see God. And they know they're looking at God. And there's no doubt as to who they're looking at. They're looking at God. They're looking at love. They're looking at the only being that there really is. But all the others sleep until they are called. And when they are called, then they are awakened. And as they awake, 
to have these experiences. And when these experiences are completed within them, it doesn't matter when the little aim comes, because they are not restored to life anymore. They are part of the heaven world. They are already a citizen of heaven, already sharing in that one body that is the glorified body. So when you hear the story on Sunday, if you go to church, on Sunday it's nice. You won't find me there, but if you go on Sunday, it will be Palm Sunday. That triumphant entrance into Jerusalem. <coughs> then comes the grand dissolution, the trial. That one man must die for the nation. As we told you last week, what it meant, only one being fell, carrying with us all. So the one is buried in all. And the one buried in you is the Son of God. And when he wakes in you, you are the Son of God. But beyond that, just a matter of moments, to be exact, 139 days later, he brings you to the Son, and the Son calls you Father, and then you know who you are, you're God the Father. And then the other events unfold normally within the span of 1260 days. That is in store for every being in this world. Then you tell it, some believe it, some do not believe it doesn't really matter. He will spread and spread and spread because everyone is going to experience it. But God in his infinite mercy hides from you the pain of the past because you've gone through hell. Let no one tell you you have not gone through the furnaces. Everyone goes through the furnaces before he comes to this point in the drama. So all the things were placed upon your shoulder and you were beaten as you are told in that word face and they put the word before Jesus they call it son they put it before David they call it servant they should not do that translators but nevertheless that's what they do I tell you you are the son raised to the father and when you're raised to the father the son then is David. As told you in scripture. But scholars with all their studying cannot arrive at that conclusion because they start from false premises. If I start from a false premise, my conclusion will be false. And all the scholarship in the world cannot undo it if my premise is false. But revelation undoes it. And you can't deny revelation. And revealed truth cannot be logically proven. It's simply revealed. Then you go back into scripture and you try to find where on earth this was foretold in scripture. And there you find it. But you didn't find it before it was revealed. So revealed truth cannot be logically proven to anyone of this world. But after it's revealed, don't go any further in the Bible, go back into the Old Testament and there you find it. It was always there, but not for the scholarly mind to detect. Not until it actually happened. So after 2,000 years of teaching a false premise, the conclusions must be wrong because premises must move forward to the normal conclusion. All ends bring forth, I mean, all origins bring forth after its kind. And so that is my origin, my premise, then the end is going to be just like it. That's going to be false. But I am telling you, the day will come, you will meet him. And when you meet him, you are God the Father, and he is exactly what Scripture tells you. He is your son, and his name is David, the Beloved. So on Sunday, when you see the poem, bear in mind, the palm is in the genealogy of Jesus. You'll find it as the mother of the twins. 
Her name was Tamar. The word Tamar means palm. She's one of the few women mentioned in the great drama of Christ. And here we are told, and Jacob had Judah. He was the father of Judah and his brothers. They didn't mention the first three. They could have mentioned Reuben and Levi and so on. But they jumped to the fourth one and mentioned Judah, the one who has the scepter and it never passes from his hand. And then, this, and then he was the father. And then they mentioned the twin, Perez, his brother, and then by Tamar. Tamar is the palm tree, the stately one, as the psalmist writes of Israel, that king of Israel is just like the palm tree, that stately, majestic being, and it's Tamar. So you'll find the reason for this palm, which will be used, but they will not understand it. Why are we going to pass out little palms made in the form of a cross and give them out to those who come to service. But nevertheless, it is only a part of the unfolding drama, all within Scripture. 